All right, Brian Ward, thank you for joining this episode. What a timely, timely episode for me personally, after just becoming a dad just over three months ago now, what a wild ride it's been. How long have you been a dad for? <laughs> uh, well, my oldest is 25. So, um, 25 and my youngest is uh, 22. So wow. I've been, I've been what I like to call around the parenting block a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more experienced than me, just a little bit, which, uh, with experience comes a lot of wisdom. So we're going to talk a, a lot about that, but first of all, welcome to the, uh, podcast and you have your own podcast as well. The dad up podcast. I was introduced to you from one of my good friends, Brian. He's like, would you mm -hmm. like to connect with, uh, with Brian? I was like, yeah, absolutely. It makes perfect sense for him to be on my episode let alone, you know, just becoming a dad now, but I would have loved to have you at any point. Cause this is something that's been top of mind for a while for me now. Uh, just being a good father, being a good dad, and uh, also being a good husband. There's a lot that goes with that. And I can't wait to dive into this. Also, you are a Marine, once a Marine, always a Marine. So mm -hmm. thank you for your service. I do appreciate <laughs> that. And uh, as we mentioned, father of two. So wow, what, what a background you have. How in the world did you go from being a Marine to having your own dad up podcast? <laughs> well, first of all, let me start by saying thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. And uh, it's interesting because I was just realizing this, and I don't know why this didn't click before, but our, our mutual friend, Brian, connected us. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, uh, and Ryan. Uh, so <laughs> we got Brian, Brian and Ryan. So maybe we should, the three of us should do our own podcast together. I would be up for it. 100%. Uh, yeah. With the, the Brian, Brian and Ryan show. Um, anyways, uh, so thanks very much for having me on and I appreciate it. And yeah, you know, listen, I mean, I spent four years in the Marine Corps, um, not because I wanted to go into the military, uh, because I felt like I had no other choice. And uh, uh, let me expand on that a little bit. I grew up in a home that, you know, my parents to this day are still married. They're over 50 years married. Um, but it was sort of a, it was not a healthy home uh, for the most part. We, you know, we didn't go to church, any of those kinds of things. My parents were drinkers. Um, they were, you know, they smoked cigarettes and all that kind of stuff. They did that. They did the normal stuff that, that, you know, those parents back in those days did. But there was also this disconnect with th their relationship with me in that, all the things that I did as a kid, um, sports, uh, schooling, uh, I got A's and B's throughout high school and A's and B's in college. Um, and I played a number of different sports. Um, they hardly came to anything. And that wasn't necessarily because they didn't want to, it was just because they didn't have to, they had to, they had to continue working. They were working two jobs. Sometimes my mom had three jobs. She'd work once in the morning or during the day, she'd work once in the evening. And then a couple of times a week, she had her own cleaning service where she was going around and cleaning offices. So they had to do what they had to do to make ends meet for the family. And um, so when I got into college, uh, started going to community college, <laughs> I told my dad, I said, you know, I spent all this time uh, going to high school, going to school and playing sports and stuff. And now I'm in college and I'm working and I'm, I'm making a lot of money working. Uh, you know, for a young kid, I thought I was making a lot of money. Uh, and uh, I said, I think I want to take a break from uh, from school and just focus on work, maybe have a little bit of fun, relax a little bit. And then maybe in six months or so, I'll go back to school. And my dad goes, uh, now this is coming from somebody who who barely got his GED. My dad said, if you take a break from college right now, you'll never go back. Mm. And I'm like, of course I will. He's like, no, you won't. Trust me, you will not go back. And if you're not going to go back to college or you're not going to stay in college since you're living in my house, you're now going to pay rent because you want to be a grown up and we were going to support you while you went through college, but now you want to be a grown up and be independent. That's fine. Totally down with that. But now you're going to pay rent. And I'm like, what the world is going on? You know, I'm like 18, 19 years old. I'm like, what is going on here? Um, and I just said, you know what? Then I'll just go into the military. And I threw that at my dad thinking he would go, no, 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 no. You know, I kind of threw it out there just to see how he'd react. And he goes, good, that'd be good for you. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> you're not supposed wow. to say that. Wow. Um, so that's kind of how it transitioned. And I, you know, I had to kind of, I had to kind of follow what I said, right? I had to keep my promise that I was going to go well, to the didn't military. didn't have so I, to. <laughs> no, but I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to look like I was, you know, I didn't want to look like I was being fake to my dad. Like I wanted to show him, like I was serious, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, I will show you dad. I'm serious. Right. Uh, and yeah, I started talking to a guy that was a, my store manager at the store I was working at. And I told him, I said, like, yeah, I think I'm going to go into the service. I knew he spent time in the service. Uh, and he's like, Oh, what, what branch do you want to go into? And I said, the air force. And he goes, no, you don't. I'm like, what? 
He's like, you don't. I'm like, why? He goes, you don't want to go in the Air Force. You want to go in the Marines. I'm like, what? No, I don't want to go in the Marines. They're, that's too hard. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> right. He's like, nope. He goes, I'm not letting you leave unless you commit to going in the Marines. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I went down, I did interview. Sorry, I did interview, um, go and talk to all the different branches. Uh, and honestly, I did in, appreciate and like the recruiter for the Marine Corps uh, a little bit more than everybody else. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it transitioned to where I went from, you know, growing up into the Marines. And from the Marines, I mean, I spent four years in the Marine Corps. I traveled overseas. Uh, I spent most of my time in Southern California, but I spent six months in Japan. Um, I did that tour over there. Um, I was worked for the flight equipment flight. I worked on flight gear basically. So I worked in the air wing division. Um, and when I got out of the Marines, I was at the time, my last year in the Marine Corps, I was dating my wife and, uh, she and I were going to plan on getting married, but I didn't want to stay in the Marines anymore. I, I decided the four years was enough for me. I wanted to get out and what we call in the military, I wanted to live a civilian life and uh, do my own thing. And fast forward, my wife and I got married. We had two kids. Now they're adults, right? I, I mean, I took a big jump there, but now they're adults uh, because I want to get to how I got the podcast going. My older son was a co was in college. Uh, my younger son was a freshman in high school. I mean, a, a senior in high school. And I had spent as a dad, and this is going to be good for you, Ryan. I had mm. spent so much time as a dad devoting my time to my boys, everything they did, field trips, uh, parent-teacher conferences, performances, uh, sports. I coached every single one of their sports all the way up through high school. Um, so I did all those things for my boys. I was always there, always there. Um, and now I was coming to a point where I was now a dad that had one that was away at college and another one that was about to go. And I thought, what in the hell am I going to do now? Like my dad journey has officially ended when he graduates and goes to college. My dad journey's over. Like, that's it. Now I don't know what else to do. I, I don't know what else. I, I've only been a dad. That's mm -hmm. all I know. Like, what else am I supposed to do? And as we know, your dad journey never ends, right? But that's how I felt at the time. And I have to admit, I got really, uh, I got a lot of anxiety over it. I got a lot of worry over it. Like I really, it was bothering me. Like it really did affect me. And, uh, I was talking to um, my brother-in-law who has a, a, a very well-known podcast. Uh, and he's like, you have always been such a great dad. You should do a podcast about being a dad. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. He's like, yeah, you just interview guys, get their perspective on fatherhood, maybe help other dads out there. I'm like, all right, I'll think about it. I told my wife about it that night. And she's like, oh my gosh, you have to start it. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. I mean, that's literally how it started. I, I knew nothing about podcasts, didn't know how to put them together. Just started doing some research on it, threw a podcast together, had my one of my best friends on the show as my first guest. And uh, here we are four and a half, almost five years later, um, almost, you know, I'm almost 250 episodes in and I am, uh, you know, I've been featured on CNN. I've been featured in publications. I've been on radio. Um, I've had all these opportunities and I, I don't even think those are the great ones. What's great about the opportunities that I've had running the podcast is meeting different people. I've met so many people and, and have connected with so many people, have networked with so many people. There have been people that I've connected with that I've, re, that I've had other people connect with because they've needed some help in some areas that this friend that I now know does, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's the joys of, of running a podcast is just the fact that you get to network and meet new people practically every day. And um, yeah, social media is not, not the best at certain things, but social media is great when it comes to networking. So I completely that's a, agree. That's a very long story. Of how <laughs> it's I got all here. good. Completely agree with a lot of that, especially when you started a podcast, you know how to start. Uh, you know, had your friends on in the beginning, like you probably made a lot of mistakes. You probably forgot to plug in your microphone, like all that stuff happens. And then four and a half, five years later, it's like, here we are. It's crazy. The doors that starting a podcast will open is insane. It gives you a platform to reach out to people and talk to people. Otherwise you never would have heard from perhaps never would have heard back from, but uh, yeah, starting a podcast. If anybody's out there thinking about that, go for it. You got nothing to lose a lot to gain, uh, but we don't need to go down that road right now. I was listening to you talking and about how you, you showed up to a lot of your son's games and events and all that stuff. I can't imagine you have a single regret about that, right? Like 
as a dad, I don't want to look back and say, I wish I did that different or I wish I spent less time like at work and more time with my son or whatever. Mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting you, I wasn't expecting to hear that from your mouth when you're like, when they were growing up, I, I thought you were going to say that you spent too much time at work and you missed a lot of opportunity with them. But I find it wonderful that you went to all their events and everything. And I'm just thinking you probably don't regret that whatsoever. Right. Cause now that it's gone, you can't get that back. Right. No, I don't regret that. And the interesting thing is, is that was the reason I was that way as a, as a dad to my boys uh, is because of how I was raised and how my relationship with my own parents was at the t- time when I was growing up in their household. My parents didn't come to anything. They had to work a lot. Uh, they weren't super involved in what I was doing. Now, I wasn't a bad kid. I, you know, I, I, I was a good kid. I didn't get into trouble. You know, I, I got good grades. I played sports. I did all the stuff that normal kids do, but um, I just missed out on my parents. And I used to, I remember being a kid and riding to my little league games or my soccer games and riding to those games or practices with my other friends' parents because my own parents weren't there, couldn't take me and were not going to go. Hmm. Um, I, I played in a lot of games and a lot of, um, you know, for soccer and baseball. And then in high school, I had, a, I played water polo. I was on swim team and I wrestled and my parents, I can tell, I can count on one hand, how many things they came to my whole life. Wow. And I knew then that I was no way I was going to do that to when I had kids, when I grew up and have kids, there's no way I'm doing this because I want my parents there. They're not going to be there. I have to look up in the stands and see my other friends, parents, and my friends are sitting there, sitting there waving at their parents. Cause they're there supporting them, but I don't have that support mm. uh, that affected me. And I knew I wasn't going to be that way when, when, when I had kids. And, um, I will tell you right now, if I brought both my boys in here, 20, 25 and 22, they will tell you that bar none, I was there every single thing that they did. I just was there. And, uh, Hey, maybe, maybe they were tired of seeing me all of the time, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I must've done something right because they're two of my best friends. And I know that they feel the same about me. We have a super strong bond and a super strong relationship. And I attribute that to not only how they're raised, the love that they've got from me and their mother, but also the way that I raised them and, and how I was so involved in their life. And I did not want to go on my deathbed where I'm about to go meet my heavenly father with any single regret. Mm-hmm. My dad right now is in his seventies. And he says to me all the time, I'll get random text from him, or he'll just call me up and just say, Hey, I love you. Um, I, I am proud of the man you became and I'm sorry I wasn't a better dad to you. Mm. Like he says those things to me and I've had my dad on the show. I mean, we've kind of talked about stuff, but it's amazing to me to think he's having regrets now and he can't get it back. He can't get that time back. He has no idea what that's like now and he'll never get that back. And I didn't want to have that, that same thing. I wanted to be able to go to meet my heavenly father and go, yep. I did what I was supposed to do. I lived a full life and I have no regrets. I'm ready to go be home. And that's it. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. It's it's a matter of, uh, hey, I didn't want my boys to miss out. I don't want my boys. I mean, think about this. This this really frustrates me because I was a coach. Like I said, I coached my boys from the age of four all the way up through high school. Football, baseball, and basketball. I, I coached them. I was their head coach. But think about this. I coached so many players that had parents that were disconnected, like I was Mm -hmm. when I was a kid, right? And I always felt bad for them as a coach. I would try to be that father figure to them. I would try to be that role model to them, right? But I could see them now playing in games and looking in the stands and not seeing their own parents, Mm -hmm. not seeing their own family there and how that must affect them. And I know how that feeling is because I felt that way. And it's, 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 disheartening. It's really sad. And here's for you dads and moms that are out there. Look, I'm not downplaying your guys' working environment. You have to work. You have to provide food for the family. We're living paycheck to pay. I get all that. I get all that. There are sacrifices that you can make though, whether it's you make sure you're there and your wife continues working, or you make sure that your uh, brother or sister there so they can support their niece or nephew, whatever the case may be, or your parents so they can report that they can support their grand grandchild uh, grandchildren. Um, make sure somebody's there because here's the thing. If little Billy is playing in his basketball game, it's his first game, maybe it's his fifth game and you have not been there and seen him play and he makes his first three pointer ever in his life. 
and he's jumping up and down screaming. The coaches are screaming, the kids are screaming, the, the fans are screaming, and you're not because you're not there. And now you'll never get to see that. Now you'll never get to experience that moment. I didn't want that for my boys. I didn't want that for my relationship with my boys. So that's why it's important to me. Mm, that's really powerful. Uh, I appreciate that. It's definitely something that I want to do when I'm older. I want to keep an eye on that. I know sometimes you can probably start going down the down a path of working too much. You get caught up into it and a year or two goes by. You're like, whoa, okay, hold on a second. I, I'm, I'm working too much. I mean, thankfully your dad is like still alive to be able to tell you that. I can only imagine how many parents were absent and then they you know, passed away. They're no longer mm -hmm. with us and they're not able, they're not able to communicate that to their kids and nothing's ever said. And they hold on to that regret and uh, the resentment forever. And that's a really tough spot to be. So I'm just thankful that your parents are your dad is actually reaching out to you and telling you this. I mean, it's better late than never, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I still, I still, to this day, I'm in my fifties. I still, to this day, have that resentment towards yeah. my parents. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I I'm in my fifties and I'm still picturing myself as a little kid mm. being mad that my parents aren't there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yes, I get it. Um, but you know what? Uh, my dad and I have a, have a pretty decent relationship now. Um, it's not the best, it's not a hundred percent fixed, but, um, we have a pretty good relationship right now. And the last thing I want to do, my wife has actually helped me realize this. The last thing I want to do is have so much frustration or, uh, resent towards my parents that when they do pass that I regret not fixing mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. and I can't rely on them to do it. I have to make sure I try to do it. And, um, so that's kind of where my focus is right now with them, um, is just making sure that I try to be as, as involved with them as possible and rebuild that relationship with them. I have a great relationship with them. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but, um, just kind of rebuild that, that connection and relationship with them. Kind of sounds like something that I try to do is like, what would future Ryan tell current Ryan? Like, did you try hard enough? Did you reach out? Did you do this? Did you do that? And if the answer is yes. And you have no regrets. You can live life happily the rest of your life. But if you're just like, I shoulda, I woulda, I coulda, that's a tough place to be. And you don't want to yeah. live like that. So yeah, completely appreciate that. Something I want to hit on is you mentioned that you and your sons are best friends. Now, something that I look forward to being with my son is his quote unquote best friend. But at the same time, you still got to be a dad. You still got to mm -hmm. apply the ground rules and they still got to follow the rules while they live under the roof and all that good stuff. Um, do you have any tips or advice for being best friends to your kids, but also being that parental figure? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. And <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of, uh, people that probably disagree with me. Um, listen, I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't have a therapist degree. Like I didn't, I don't have a psychology degree, none of that kind of stuff, but I do consider myself a professional dad because I've been a dad for so many years. And the one thing that I can tell you, um, for me anyways, personally, is I always was very close with my boys and always remained sort of uh, like friends with them, but they also had a level of respect for me and I had a level of respect for them. So as a parent, you have to establish those boundaries, right? Right. Like this is, I'm the parent. I'm, my job is to take care of you. Mm -hmm. And because I'm the parent and I have to take care of you, there's going to be a set of boundaries that you're going to have to follow and stay within. And as long as you do that, you and I will have a fantastic relation. You and I will have a great time. We can, we can do the things we want to do and, and all that kind of good stuff. But at the same time, son or daughter, at the same time, there's some boundaries and rules that you're going to have for me. And I have to make sure I in turn follow those rules for you to give you that respect and that um, to give you that independence that you need as you get older. So I'll give you an example. When they're little, they want to they, they they aspire to be like mom or dad, right? When they're very little, they want to be just like mom or dad. But when they start hitting those preteen years, that mentality starts to change, and that's okay. Here's why it changes. They want to discover who they are. They say, okay. I have lived in my life this way, liked these things because my dad's like these things or my mom's like these things. But you know what? I sort of like this other stuff. I sort of like this other stuff and I want to figure out who I am. So they go through their preteen and that's why they have such a, this is why 
Um, it's proven. You can research it. This is why kids struggle with teenage years so much emotionally and physically, because not only are they going through a lot of hormonal changes, but they're also going through this change of really trying to figure out who they are, discover what they're supposed to do in life, discover the independence that they're supposed to live. And so it's important for them to separate themselves from their parents because they're, they're in that phase, right? So the level of respect that I gave my boys is I said, look, they were always with me, always hung out with me, did all the stuff I did when I were little. But then when they start to get those years where they didn't want to hang out with dad anymore, I didn't have resentment towards them. Hmm. I didn't say, oh, you got, you, then you can't go, you know, that kind of stuff. I wasn't like that. It's like, I knew where my boys were headed. I knew what their point was. And I'm not going to take offense that they're not they're still my friend. They're st I'm still their friend, but we're still parent and son, right? So I'm not going to take resentment to the fact that they don't want to hang out with me. They don't want to take a picture with me. They don't want me to hug them when they go to school. <laughs> they don't want any of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I totally get that um, because I knew, I knew that when they start to hit the pre-adult years and those adult years get into them, that they would come back and uh, it happens every time. And so as long as that relationship with your kids is built and continues to be built throughout their younger years and teenage years, when they do come back, it's all that much better when they come back because you built that bond with them and that relationship with them. So how did we become friends and parent son relationship? It was just simply a matter of establishing the boundaries and the rules to how we wanted to live our lives as parent and son or as dad and son. And that those boundaries and rules applied, went to the same way for them too. They could tell yeah. me, this is dad. I don't want, I, I want you to knock before you come in my room. You know, those kinds of things. I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to do that. This mm -hmm. is my house, right? If I'm going to walk in your room, I'm going to walk in your room. You don't tell me if I have that, I have to knock. No, I gave my kids that level of respect. And because I did those things, they behaved they didn't get into trouble. Now, don't get me wrong. They got into trouble and did some stuff and, and <laughs> you know, all that, you know, kids do that kind of stuff, right? But for the most part, uh, they did behave, didn't get into trouble, got good grades, both graduated college with uh, uh, A's and B's. I mean, those kind of things. And now they're both working and doing their thing. So yeah, it's a, it's a matter of how you raise them. And it's a matter of where they understand the level of respect and rules are. And it goes both ways. That's my long-winded saying uh, way of saying that. That's no, that's amazing, and I can definitely see that working. It just um, makes me feel like there's a level of ownership in that relationship. It's not just like mom and dad rule the house, and own everything, everything they say goes. They actually have a say in the matter too, which it just feels good from both sides. It just it just feels really good. And, and the question that I had for you as well is, how did you go about? telling your kids you're not perfect? Did you tell them? Did you show them? Like you just mentioned, our kids kind of view their parents as heroes. At some point, right. they kind of find out they aren't really heroes. They're just human. Um, mm. I can definitely see myself having this conversation with my son when he's older. Like, hey, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm human. I, I want him to know that. I want him to see that because I want him to see how I do make mistakes and correct them. And I get back up again and try again. And like, did you ever have that conversation with your kids or did you show them how, or, or how did that go? Um, yeah. And that's, it's something that parents uh, have to learn. And, and especially dads, dads carry a lot of, uh, you know, we have this ego, we have this chip on our shoulder, right? We're, we're the man of the house. We have to be the leader of the house. We have to, you know, we have kind of carry that kind of toughness to us. Right. But one of the greatest things you can do as a dad for your kids is when you mess up and you know, you've messed up. But you want to you want to you want to put be the tough guy and, and not admit that you you made a mistake. You they've got to live by your rules. Um, that's great, but that's not going to get you very far. The biggest thing you could do for your kids is go up to them when you mess up and say, "I'm sorry, hmm. I made a mistake. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I let that happen. I can't believe that I reacted that way. Um, that's not." how I want to react. That's not how I want to be as your dad. Um, so I'm going to, and this is what I told my boys. And listen, this is constant. This goes on their whole lives, right? There've probably been, there've probably been a couple of times since they've been an adult that I've said, you're right. I messed up. I apologize. Hmm. And because they have to know that, Hey, I am human. 
They have to know that, hey, I do make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But what do we learn from those mistakes is what's important. And so I used to tell my boys when they were little, uh, when I messed up, and there was quite a few times that I messed up as a dad. Um, but I would, number one, ask them if I could get their permission to talk to them. Hmm. Because they might not be in the right headspace for you to talk to. They may still have be upset at you. They may they have, may have a little bit of attitude. So it's going to go in one ear and out the other when you try to talk to them. So I asked my kids for their permission to talk to them. And then when my kids were calmed down and they said, yes, I want to talk, then I would go into sit in their room with them where it was just the two of us. And I would get down to their level, meaning I'm not talk, standing up and talking over them. I would be down eyesight to eyeball to eyeball. And I would talk to them and say, listen, I messed up. I reacted that way and I cannot believe that I did that. I allowed myself to get that way. And what I can tell you is I'm sorry, number one. Number two, I will do everything in my power not to let that happen again. Now, I can't say that it won't. I can't say I'm not, I'm, I'll be perfect at it, but I can assure you that I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best to not ever let that happen again. So I'm sorry and I hope you forgive me. Hmm. That's what I used to do with my boys. And it was that simple. And that told my, my boys went, wow, dad's, he's chill. He's cool. He's, he's, he's like, he's human, right? He makes mistakes and he owns it. That teaches them a valuable lesson in owning our crud, right? When they start to hit the adult years and life really hits them on the chin, if they don't know how to react because you reacted always the wrong way, they get that learned behavior from you. Then when they become an adult and life does hit them on the chin, guess what, how they're going to react. They're mm -hmm. going to react how you reacted. Why? Because it's learned behavior. Mm -hmm. So you have to teach them the learned behavior now is telling them, Hey, I made a mistake and I'm going to learn from this mistake. I've made a mistake and I'm going to learn from this mistake. I've made a mistake and I'm going to learn from this mistake. How do we learn from it? We continue to work at it every single day. And so, yes, the learned behavior is important. And that's what I wanted to instill in my boys is, is the right approach for them when they got older. Yeah, that's amazing. And I realize you are the podcast host of Dad Up, but I imagine every woman listening to this, it goes for both parents. So that's not just something for from a father. That's for both parents to have open communication and just say, I'm sorry, I screwed up. That's big. Um, I will say, I, I can imagine, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I can imagine you probably rarely heard your parents say that. I rarely heard my parents say, I'm sorry, I screwed up. Um, and I, you hit on something I want to touch on where you said like the role of the dad is masculine, macho and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And I, it's, it's still, yes, that way in a lot of households. From what you've seen growing up and now being a dad coach and being a dad yourself, how have you seen, have you seen an evolution there in the last five, 10, 15 years or so? Have you seen any kind of an evolution in that? Uh, in, in general or in my household? In general, just in general, working with dads all over the <sighs> yeah, globe. Yeah. You, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've, um, I've, I've met a lot of dads. I've talked to a lot of dads all over the world. I've talked to a lot of dads uh, and I've coached a lot of dads too. One of the things that I do now is coach dads. And one of the things that I have noticed is dads are, and this wasn't how I, how it was when I was, you know, a young dad. Um, it wasn't this way, but now dads are really starting to transition into this phase of, I need to be a little bit more involved. Right. I need to do what I have to do to be a little bit more involved. Now, I'm not saying they go over above and beyond like like I did where I was there for everything. I'm not saying you have to do that as a dad. What I'm saying is, is I'm seeing this transition of dads starting to be more involved. And I'm starting to see even a lot more literature on being a dad. So I'm seeing a lot more people writing books and stuff like that about fatherhood. I see a lot of podcasts that are popping up about, about being a dad. So I'm really, I mean it's really becoming known that, Hey, dads are really starting to say, Hey, we need to get a little bit more involved because why, why are they thinking that way? I think and this is just my hunch. I think it's because parents in general, meaning dads and moms are seeing the way that society is going and the direction that the world is going and how corrupt things are and how backwards things are and how violent things are getting you know there's there's a lot of violence in the world and a lot of violence especially in the u.s that we're going through but parents don't want their kids to go through that and a lot of kids that go through that or experience that or become that uh, are kids that didn't have the the father uh, mother role relationship or bond that that 
um, you know, that I, like I didn't have, right. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, I didn't happen to go down a, a bad road. Um, so I think that parents are now starting to realize, Hey, we need to be a little bit more in tune with our kids because we need to protect them. Number one, and we need to raise them right. Number two. And so in order to do that, we have to be a little bit more involved. And so, I, yes, to answer your question, I am seeing that transition, uh, especially over the last, you know, four or five years, particularly in the last, just in the last couple. Um, but uh, it's definitely changing, which is great. And when it comes to the moms, it's the same for the moms. You know, I'm, I'm addressing the dads a lot, but the, you're right, Ryan, this is the same thing for the moms. The, the moms are just as responsible for all those different things I talked about as the dads are. And mm -hmm. when it comes to my show, yeah, I have 60% of my, uh, my followers are men on my show. 40% are women. That's great. 40%. And that tells me that, hey, my 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 podcast isn't a dad up podcast, even though that's the title. My podcast is for parents. Mm -hmm. And I've had women on my show. I have plenty of women on my show. I've had my wife on my show. I've had I've had tons of women on my show. So um yeah, it's it's a it's both of our uh, jobs to do that as parents. So I, yes, there is a transition happening with dads. Yeah. And I, just to hit on that even more, I feel being a new dad and just being older in general, being more aware of things, I feel that the world is becoming a little more accepting of dads being more involved, which I think is great. It kind of makes me wonder, did dads always want to be this involved? They just didn't feel like they had a safe place to say that um, because I'm thinking like, Paternity leave is now kind of something uh, at people's right. jobs where it really was just kind of like my dad had me. He told me like he goes back at work like the next day or whatever. It's like that's so messed up. And um, yeah, like people want to be like, like dads want to be like stay at home dads now. And I feel like it's just a more accepting world. Whereas even like five, 10, 15, 20 years ago, whatever, you'd probably get laughed at. You just kind of feel you probably couldn't feel like you could say that or actually follow through with that. And you're shaking your head, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's a direct reflection of how our parents were raised. Mm. So our parents were raised, you think about, you know, my dad and mom are in their late 60s, uh, uh, 70s. That's how old my parents are. And think about the relationship that they had with their parents and the time frame when they, my parents were teenagers or younger, uh, how many years back that was for, you know, we're talking 50s and 60s, right? When uh, they were growing up. And in that era, what was going on in that time frame was what the mom stayed home and did everything with the kids, everything. She cleaned the house. She made dinner. She took care of the kids. She did all that stuff with the kids. And what did the dad do all week long? He mm -hmm. worked mm -hmm. all week long. And it was, we're talking about like not 40 hours back then. They didn't know what 40 hour work weeks were because they were more like 80. So that's what a lot of dads did. And so that's how our parents were raised. So when our parents became care parents, there was some transition. Some people kind of went off that boat a little bit and did and and became parents the way they're supposed to. And then others continued the same pattern as their own parents because, as I said before, that is learned behavior. That's what they know. That's what they're used to. That's how they grew up. So they're going to continue that role. It's the same thing with uh, you know, when you hear statistics about you know um, girls that 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 are in abusive relationships. Well, they're typically in abusive relationships because their mom was typically in abusive relationship. It's just a pattern, right? It's just that mm -hmm. pattern that keeps rolling. It's the same thing with parents. So when I see parents now starting to make that transition, um, it's 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 great. It's awesome. I think it's it's very cool. But don't get me wrong. There's still a number of people out there. I I mean, I've even had a few dads on my show that I thought were seemed like they were kind of in tune with their kids. And then I start to interview them and all they want to talk about is their business and mm -hmm. their stuff. And, and they address their kids for just a minute when I ask them a question, but then they go on to their stuff. And those, there's plenty of those people out there that are like that. And if that's how you want to be great, I'm not saying don't be that way parents. But what I'm saying is if you're a parent, you shouldn't be that way mm -hmm. because your kids are missing you right now because you're missing out on those opportunities that I addressed earlier that I'm not going to go into again, but uh, you're missing out on those opportunities. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's totally a, a, a pattern that, uh, that our parents followed and that's how it, that's how it kind of got rolling. And on the flip side of that coin, I can imagine you've had a lot of dads on, <clears throat> we'll continue to have a lot of dads on 
that are that feel the pressure of being the breadwinner and or I have to work because this is my role in the family. And like I said, they probably feel like a lot of pressure. Like I, I can't screw up my job. I can't get laid off. I can't get fired. I can't do this. I have to keep producing. I have to mm-hmm. try to make more money. Now we have inflation. Now the world costs more than what you know what it was when we were younger, our parents were younger. Um how prevalent is that within the male population and the dad population that you interview, just the pressure that they feel to have to provide for the family with their work? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of the dads that I interview, I really focus on the point of my show is to really focus on dads who are not only successful in what they're doing outside the home, but what dads are doing inside the home as well, being that successful dad inside the home as well. And for you know, for the dads that I talk to, they do feel that pressure that hey i have to be the the provider for the family yes there is there is a level of responsibility that you have as a as the man of the house that you need to take care of and provide for your family however because things are more expensive because the world is changing um there's a lot majority of households now are two income right the mom mm-hmm. and the dad are both working, right? Um, but if you're not in that boat where you have, where you're able to make enough money to where your wife can stay home, that's awesome. That's great. My wife stayed home for many years until my boys went to school, and then she didn't want to be home by herself anymore. So she started. She became a school teacher. Um, but uh, if that's how you want to be, that's great. But here's the thing: you have to keep in mind that when you're putting that much pressure on yourself to be that provider and always be working because you need to make sure you provide uh, food and and clothing and money for the family. Um, just keep in mind that you have to make exceptions to those uh, times when your family needs you. So when your family needs you, you have to be able to shift gears and be there for your family. Mm-hmm. When your child is is participating in something, make sure you're there because that's more important than putting dollars in your pocket. Your child's events and your child, the things that your kids are going through, watching them grow up, watching them learn new things as a, as a baby, uh, that's more important. In my opinion, that is more important than putting dollars in my pocket. So I would rather, as a dad, I didn't, I'll tell you what, I'll give you an example. This year, this year, okay, this is no joke, people. I'm telling you right now, this year, 2024, the very first year that I've ever purchased a brand new vehicle, brand new, <laughs> brand new. All the vehicles that I, and I've owned 20, 30 cars in my life. All the vehicles that I owned were always used. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they were cheaper. Mm-hmm. Because I wanted to make sure I saved a little bit of money uh, because it can't, I wanted to make sure I took care of my family. So I sacrificed things in my life. My wife sacrificed things in her life to provide for our boys and give them what they need and also be involved. So yeah, I bought a brand new vehicle this year. First time ever. Um, right. So those sacrifices you have to make. And when, when working in corporate America, when I was coaching sports, my boys, I used to go into the office at four o'clock in the morning mm. when no one else was there because I knew I had to leave at two in order to go coach my boys. So I wanted to make sure I was fully committed to my company, but I want to make sure I was fully committed to my boys too. So that required me to be in the office at 4 a.m. So I could get all my work done. So my, my employer's happy. They say, yep you're, you're doing great. And I'm keeping my boys happy as well. So my point is, is you have to make sacrifices. Um, you have to be willing to make sacrifices and it's not always about the dollar and, and dads do need to get that, um, out of their head a little bit. I I think that's That's, amazing by the way. Yeah, that's amazing. That's how you handle priorities right there. That is awesome. I love that. That's a great example. Um, something, a consistent theme I am seeing throughout, which I think is super important is being present. Um, I want to weave this into the next topic of, we're going to, we're going to take this from the perspective of the father and or the parents Mm -hmm. and the children. Our lives now are full of electronic devices. Mm -hmm. We cannot get off of them. Mm -hmm. I was going to start with the kids first and how you handle that and how that's evolved over the years. I actually want to start with the parent first, because now a lot of us work from home. We have our devices and phones constantly on us, taking phone calls, probably during our kids' soccer game. We're looking at work emails at eight o'clock at night instead of winding down and putting our kids to bed. Mm -hmm. So for the dads that come to you uh, with this issue or or that you've just talked to about like, hey, I can't get off my work phone, work's always on, blah, blah, blah. 
do you have any advice for those people? And then I want to reverse it and we'll take it from the kid's angle. Yeah. Well, first I want to know how bad do they want it? Do they want to get off their phone? Do they want to get away from the the device that they're using to, uh, to be more in tune with their family? So that's number one, because there are dads, don't get me wrong. There are dads out there that think they want that, but they really don't because as soon as that, that phone buzzes, they have to go check it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that you're just not, you're not committed to, to being the best dad you can be by being, uh, 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 giving them your undivided or, or being intentional with your time. <clears throat> kids, here's, here's something you should remember dads or moms, dads and moms, kids spell love, T-I-M-E. That's how they spell love. Mm. And they spell love like that because the amount of time that you're spending with your child, intentional time that you're spending with your child tells them how important they are to you and tell, and it helps that bond and that relationship grow even stronger. So for dads that come to me, and I've had dads that do that, I have had dads that come and ask me about how do I, how do I transition from the office and I've had a frustrating day and I transition into the dad role again when yeah. I walk in the house. Yep. Yep. I've, I've, I've coached dads through that too. What you have to do, number one, is realize, do I really want this? Do I really want to put down this device? Am I really worth make, am I Am I really going to make that sacrifice for my family? And if they say, yes, I'm ready to do that, then it's simple. And I'm going to help you out. Number one, when you wake up in the morning, I don't want you touching your phone or your laptop or your computer for at least 30 minutes when you wake up, at least 30. That helps you get awake. That helps you get um, in tune with what's going to go on through the day. That helps you check in with the family and your device is away, right? And then when you're at home in the evening time, I know some people have to, you know, I have the same thing. I've got a work email that I, that I continue to, to check. I have to keep an eye on. But guess what? When I get home in the evening time at between six and seven, that's generally when I do it. I put my phone on the counter and it stays and I don't touch it again mm -hmm. until 30 to 30 minutes to an hour. I do 30 minutes to an hour when I wake up. I don't touch it again until then. Um, my wife's a little different. She keeps her phone by the bedside, but she does that because our boys don't, you know, my son's in Arizona, lives in Arizona. So if anything goes on or anything happens, they need to get a hold of us. She wants to be able to have the phone right by her in case, mm -hmm. in case they, uh, they need something. Mm -hmm. But for me, my phones, I have two phones. My phones stay right on the counter at seven o'clock. I don't look at them again until uh, an hour after I wake up. And um, that was just a sacrifice I was willing to make. And, and when your, here's another example. When your child needs your attention, if you're in the middle of work, Let's say you're in the middle of typing an email. You're like going crazy on this email and your kid comes up to you. I'm in the middle of this email. Da, 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 da. Kid comes up to me. Dad, 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 dad. I have to ask you something. I have to ask. Okay. All right. All right. Here's, here's what you do, dad. Very simple. If you, if it's that important, that email is that important. I understand. So here's what you do. Ask your child, say, son, daughter, can you give me two seconds, two seconds, stay right here. Give me two seconds. Let me finish this email. And then you'll have all my attention. Is that mm -hmm. fair? Mm -hmm. Ask them their, their, ask them for permission. Ask them and they'll say, okay, they'll kind of do that, right? So then you finish your email and you give them your atten their attention. You have to make sure you're there for your kids and your family when they need you. That was my point. Because you I mean, have to make that's sure- That's great for there. a relationship, period. Like not right. even just kids to adults. That's just uh, great for a marriage or any kind of relationship. <laughs> no, for <laughs> sure. I was going to say, there's nothing like talking to somebody that's got half your attention on like their device and they have their attention on you. I'm just like, I'll wait. Finish what you got to yeah. do. I'll wait. So- so you're talking to me as a podcast host. I've got my phone right here <clears throat> and you're asking me questions and I'm sitting here looking down at my phone. Mm -hmm. How's, I mean, what's that message send you? I, I mean, I, I hate that. I, I hate that. <laughs> yeah. I can see that. I can tell, I can tell when I talk to another adult and I'm having a conversation with them, mm -hmm. they could be looking me in the eye and I can tell when I'm in the middle of my sentence, I could say to myself, they have no clue what I'm saying right now. <laughs> no clue. The worst. Because they're so out of tune, right? They're so out of tune. I think, part of the military kind of made that made me very in tune with things that go on around me. Mm. Um, I think that's just kind of, I think I was kind of the military thing in me, I guess, because it doesn't matter where I'm at. If I go somewhere, I have to make sure I know my surroundings. I'm, I'm very particular in different things. If I walk into a brand new room and I'm sitting down somewhere, I don't sit down with my back to the door. I mean, it's just weird things that I do because of the military, but I think my time, my intentionality with my boys is not only a, a direct re result of how I was raised, but also, uh, from the lessons that I learned in the military about, uh, you know, how do I, how do I be, uh, intentional with my time? Because if I'm not, somebody could die 
in the, mm. in the, in the military, somebody could die. If you're not, if you're not focused on what you're doing, somebody could die. And so, <clears throat> yes, super important for parents, both parents, dads and moms. Uh, I want to touch on your, your <clears throat> lessons from, from the Marines momentarily, but let's, let's reverse that. So as a dad, who's going to be raising a son in this world in 2024 and beyond, you can't get away from electronic devices. They're everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. what advice or what tips would you have for me, um, when introducing a child, how to limit that? Um, cause this, for something for me, that's important. I don't want right. social media to play a part in their life for quite a while. <laughs> I don't want to just hand them devices to make them stop crying. I have no intention on doing that. I'm not even going to mention AI because I kind of know what the world is going to look like with AI and kids aren't even writing their essays anymore. They're just typing in a mm -hmm. question to chat GPT and everything's written for them. I'll worry about that down the road. Um, but as far as devices go, what trends are you seeing? What are you seeing that's working? What are you seeing that's not working? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. It's always funny when I go into a restaurant, my wife, and I go into a restaurant, we sit down and there's a family sitting two tables over from us and they're, they're Adults are maybe conversing or talking and the kids sitting there like doing nothing like getting antsy because they're, they're, they have nothing to do. They have no one to talk to. And the mom reaches over and hands the phone to the kid. Right. Mm -hmm. And now the kid's got his face in the, I mean, what are you teaching your kid then? It's You're terrible. teaching your kid not to have human connection, not to have human conversation with people around you, but to indulge in what's on a screen. That means nothing to you and will serve no purpose in your life. Zero other than to give you a brief bit of satisfaction or that gratification of keeping myself entertained at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. So for parents, for us, <clears throat> both my boys, uh, we gave them cell phones uh, when they turned the age of 12. But <clears throat> there's a caveat to that. We only gave them a cell phone at the age of 12 if they proven to us from you know when they were growing up to the age of 12 that they're responsible, that they behave, you know, they they follow the rules, all those kinds of things. And there was also restrictions that we put on the phone. When you have, when you're in school, your phone is not on, it's not, you're not touching it when you're in school, right? If you need to call me or mom, then you can you can ask the teacher or ask the school for permission to call us. But other than that, you're not touching your phone. <clears throat> That's number one. And I'll give you a story on that too, because um, I have one. Um, <clears throat> number two, when they have homework to do, or they have responsibilities in the household, the devices are put away there. Those are no longer in your view when we're doing those kinds of activities where you have chores or you have homework, that's more important than a device. And number three, there was time frames that we allowed our kids to be on those devices. So listen, Hey, you know what? We have to get this done, but when we get this done, you can sit and play on your iPad for an hour, Right. So those are the kinds of things that we did with our boys. And I do hear other parents incorporating those kinds of things as well. But I also hear the flip side. I just talked to a dad. <clears throat> my voice is going because I just had a podcast interview. <laughs> I just talked to a dad who has teenage kids and he ha they don't give them cell phones yet. They haven't given them a cell phone. They don't want them on devices. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what does that do? That teaches them that, hey, I don't have to rely on a device to get me through life right? I need to be able to have human connection. I need to be able to have things outside of, I mean, look at I mean, Ryan, when you and I were growing up, we used to play with our play out in the street. Oh God. Yeah. <clears throat> you know what I mean? We used to ride our bikes. We used to play football. We didn't, we didn't have the devices that the kids have now. But the question is, let me uh, hold on. The question <clears throat> is, is do they feel left out and or lonely or whatever, because all their friends are talking to each other and they can't be included in their <clears throat> group or anything. Yeah. So you'll have, you'll have, um, kids that will have that kind of situation go on, but there are ways around that. And there are, there are a number of, let's say, let's say you do have to give yourself, your kid a cell phone. Let's say, you know, I don't want my kid being without a cell phone in case anything goes on. You know, a lot of crazy stuff goes on in schools nowadays. And I don't, I just want to, don't want him to not have access to me if he has to get a hold of me. So you're going to have a cell phone son or daughter, but here's what we're going to do. We're putting uh, restrictions on this phone. So there's control apps that you can use as a parent to actually control their phone. And I don't know, I'm sure there's parents out there to know that, or maybe some that don't, but there are actually apps that you can put on their phones or on your phone that controls their phone. So you can not only prevent them from doing the things that they shouldn't be doing on the phone, but you can also see what they're doing on the phone. 
So if they're they're texting when they're not supposed to be, or they're or texting somebody that you have no idea who they're texting, you can actually get that information and you can mm -hmm. see it. Now, is that an invasion of privacy? Yeah, I guess it is. But at the same time, it's your kid. You're doing what you're supposed to do to take care of them. And that's your phone. That's not theirs. You bought it, right? So mm -hmm. you have to make sure they're handling it and treating it the way that it's supposed to be treated. <clears throat> so that's, so yes, when it comes to kids that say, listen, mom, dad, I really want a phone. No, you're not getting one. Well, listen, all my friends have them and they all talk and they're on a chat thing. And I, and I don't get to do that. There are phones specifically designed. And I actually sponsored one uh, a couple years back, but there are phones that actually are specific for phone calls and texting. And they really do nothing else. They may have a couple little uh, kid apps and stuff on them, but they're really designed for younger kids. And those younger kids have the opportunity now to participate in the chats with their friends, but it also prevents them from getting the apps, Instagram and TikTok and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it prevents them from going on the internet, but they can make phone calls. They can talk to their grandma and papa. They can talk to their uh, friends and they can text their friends, all those uh, sorts of things. Um, additionally, you can put restrictions on their phone of who they call. So you can put various things functions in their phone to say, okay, I don't want my kid calling this area code, or I don't want my kid calling these 800 numbers or what, you know, things like that. Um, those different things are so, so prevalent now for uh, parents to uh, utilize to protect their kids. Um, it's incredible the amount of protection that there is available to uh, technology uh, to, to protect our kids. It, it's there, there's so much it's, it's endless. It's endless. And it wasn't that way when phones first came out. I mean, when mm -hmm. phones first came out, they're like, everybody's like, Oh, I'm never giving my kid a phone, uh, you know, but <clears throat> it doesn't have to be that way. Now you do what you want. We gave our boys cell phones. Um, and, uh, Oh, the other thing I want to touch on real quick, when your kid has a iPad or a cell phone or a computer, number one, that computer shouldn't be in their room. That's number one. They should not have a computer in their room. If they do, if there's no way around it, the house isn't big enough, whatever, you have to have, they need a computer in their room to do their homework or whatnot, then they are always on their computer with the door open. Hmm. They do not close that bedroom door and play on their computer. They do not close that bedroom door and play on their iPad or their phone. If they want to be on their iPad in their room, laying on their bed, chilling on their bed, great. I told my son, great, Blake, you can do that. No problem. Just keep the door open. Hmm. Why? because I want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're okay. And I don't, you know, the rules with the iPad. So yeah, make sure you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do on the iPad and that's it. And keep the door open. Okay. <clears throat> My boys did that. Yeah. So, this is, um, um, it's a topic that, yeah, it's a topic that no question that I'm a little fearful of when the time comes of how to handle this. I'm sure there's multiple ways to handle this, hopefully correctly, Ultimately, just having open communication with your son or daughter, I think is just going to be like of the utmost importance, especially when it comes to social media and who they're communicating with, what they're saying, you want to be attention to bullying, what they're seeing, like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a, it's a concern and it's hard to, I don't know, grasp and just keep control of, um, at all times. You got to trust your child at some point. And that's, um, you know, that comes and in, it's in. Yeah, go ahead. It's it's learned behavior again. It's one of those things where a kid sees their parents doing it and that's yep. what they th think is normal, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I gave you the example earlier of uh, a family sitting at the table and the mom hands the kid the, the phone to quit bugging them so they can have a conversation. That's That happens a lot. But I, what I see more often is I see a whole family sitting at the table and yeah. they're all like this. Yep. Mm. Every single one of them. And I'm like, are they talking to each other? Like, are they texting back and forth? Like, how are they having a conversation? When we go to dinner, our phones are put away, period. Oh, yeah. Our phones are put away. We don't do that now. If I have to look up something, like my wife asked me a question, I go, oh, that's a good question. Let me look that up. I'll look it up on my phone, you know, that kind of thing. But our phones are put away, period. Mm -hmm. It's just, we're here to have a human connection and enjoy a meal together. I don't need you being distracted by your phone. Yeah, that's um, a great point because your kids are going to see you on your phone. We're exactly. the, we're the generation that's learning. You know, we could be on our phones. We can find anything on our phones. We could do anything on our phones. And every time we pick it up, they're going to see that, especially yep. when they're walking. Hey, daddy, I've got a question for you. And you're like, hold on, son. I'm on my phone and blah, blah, blah. I'll get back to you in a little bit and stuff. And just, it goes both ways. You definitely have to really be aware. There's There's a lot of positive power and potential with these electronic devices, but they can do a lot of harm. You just got to be very aware. 
Um, yeah. I wanted, can I just share one more story with you? Yeah, yeah. I had mentioned earlier about the phone and, and especially kids having a phone, uh, like when they're at school and stuff like that. There's a, there's a, I actually have a story for that. And that my boys always had the rule that they had a phone with them. Uh, they had their phone with them, but they were not allowed to use it during the, during the school day, unless they needed to call us. Mm -hmm. That's when they could use it. Right. Um, so they respected that rule. Uh, I didn't have any issues with them having, having cell phones, never had any issues with them. Um, and my older son was just a brand new driver. And I was so insane about keeping an eye on him and his driving because not because of him, because of other people that I used to follow him to school and then he would park his car and then I would go to, go to work and then I would come back and follow him home. Right. Mm -hmm. If I couldn't do those things, I used to tell him when you leave somewhere, I need you to call me and say, dad, I'm here. I'm leaving right now. Okay. Where are you going? I'm going here. Okay. When you get there, give me a call and let me know that you made it. Mm -hmm. So we had that level of communication. My boys did that. Dad, I'm getting ready to leave school. Okay, great. I'll see you in a little while. They would hang up, leave. And now they're at home, right? Dad, I'm getting ready to leave for school. Great. Let me know when you're there. Dad, I'm at school. Perfect. Those kind of things we did as, as a, as a family, I did that with my boys and I only did that because I wanted to make sure they're okay. That's all. I just worry about them, right? I'm, I'm a dad. Um, but there was a time that um, my boy, my older son, was using his phone in school. He was in high school. He had just gotten his license. He was uh, maybe a year into driving. He was using his phone during class and the teacher took his phone. And she said, you, you can get this back um, at the end of the day. And he's like, okay, right? Well, I had no idea none of this went on. Um, he went back to get the phone from her at the end of the day. And she said, you can't have the phone back. Your dad has to come get it. Mm. And he's like, what? He goes, well, can my dad call you then? And she's like, no, he has to come get it. You, you don't get the phone back. Your, your dad has to come get it. Cause I need to talk to him about, you know, you using the phone. Well, um, she told it, he told her, um, teacher, uh, I'm supposed to have my phone with me when I drive. Cause my dad wants to know when I'm leaving and when I'm arriving at different places, I have to have my phone with me in case anything happens. <clears throat> and she said, I'm sorry, Blake, I'm not giving your phone back. You can tell your dad to come down here and he can pick it up. And he goes, you know, he's like, what are you supposed to do? Okay. He left and he was involved in a serious car accident. Oh, are you kidding me? It was not his fault. He was sitting at a stoplight and an old lady doing 60 miles an hour <clears throat> rear-ended him. <clears throat> oh my God. Pushed him into the car in front of him. So now my car, which was a Honda Accord, was sandwiched. Luckily, no one got hurt. However, my son did not have any way to call me, to call us. He had no way because he didn't have a cell phone with him. And when the police officers came and showed up and asked everybody all that came, my, my son said, <clears throat> ma'am, can I use your cell phone? Because I don't have a phone with me and I need to call my, my dad. And the police officer was kind enough to let her, him use her own personal cell phone. And he called me. And so I immediately, you know, we, we flew down there, took everything. Everything was fine. <clears throat> Car got handled. But guess where I was the very next morning? I was in the principal's office going, this will never, ever happen again. You will never, ever, ever keep my son's phone from him, period. And I told him what happened. And the principal was, was really upset. He's like, I'm so sorry, Mr. Ward, that that happened to you. I'm so sorry. I'm so yeah, she should have given him the phone back at the end of the day. So then I went and talked to that teacher and I said, don't you ever do that again, period. I need my boy to, to be safe. And um, <clears throat> yeah, she felt terrible. She I was, was going to say, she must have felt horrible. Yeah, she felt horrible. She thought we were kidding at first when I told her he was involved in a serious car accident. She thought we were kidding. I went, why would I joke about something like that? That's stupid. Wow. <clears throat> so yeah, that's just a story about you know, kids and, and technology. Um, we wanted our boys to have something in case they needed to get a hold of us. But now yeah. there's so much technology out there and devices that you can buy that just do texting or calling and limit all the other stuff. So mm. there are safe functions. Go freaking figure. Oof. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as we start to wrap this up, there's still a couple of things I, I do want to hit on. Um, sure. Whether it's from your time in the Marines or not, the word instill is coming to my mind. What is like the number one characteristic that 
you wanted to instill into your boys or that was the most important or or one that you look back on now you're like i am glad that i instilled this into my sons is there yeah. one that comes to mind god there's a handful there's a handful ryan i mean there's mm-hmm. so many things as parents we want to instill so many things in our ch- children to make sure they they grow up to be productive members of society and, and are good human beings right mm-hmm. um so there were so many different things that I wanted to instill in my boys to make sure that they grew up and, and were were that way. Um, but one of the things that I actually struggled with early on when they were when they were younger, I struggled with this, but quickly learned and still am learning how to um, develop this or or grow this within me to teach my boys and my boys now have are learning it as well. and that's the word patience. Patience is so important when it comes to anything we do in life whether it's as simple as brushing our teeth, have patience, do it the right way so you don't get cavities, comes to activities at at our job, make sure you have patience when you're doing this, otherwise you're going to mess up. When interacting with other people, I don't care what they said to you or did to you, you need to have patience when you're interacting with them, Uh, be a good person, and that that will come back to you. Those kinds of things is what I wanted to instill in my boys as far as um, uh, how they uh, conducted themselves was having patience in everything that they did. Mm. <clears throat> so my wife and I made sure that we were very patient with our boys. That wasn't always the case. I I had to learn that because I was one of those dads in the very early days. I was one of those dads who was like, it's my way or the highway. You know, yeah. I don't yep. care what, I don't care if I hurt your feelings, blah, blah, blah. That's how I was because that's how I was raised. And I quickly yeah, had to a lot learn. Of us my were. wife, had, yeah, my wife actually helped me learn that. She's like, listen, you're being a little ridiculous right now. And he's five. So he's not an adult. <laughs> so you need to be at a five level, not a 35 level. Mm-hmm. So fix it. <clears throat> She's like, you need to step away and I'll handle it. I had to learn. I'm like, okay. So the only way I'm going to be able to react is if I have patience and then I can respond the way I'm supposed to. So yeah, patience is big. And I coached a lot of a lot of teams uh, through the years. I've coached thousands of kids through the years. And let me tell you, when you're a coach, you have to have patience too. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you're dealing with not only 12 different kids, but you're dealing with their parents. <clears throat> That's true. I appreciate you calling that out. Patience is, mm-hmm. sounds like it would be on my list. I'm sure it would be on my list, but it wasn't the top of my list. I'm curious. So there are a few things at the top of my list that's like important to me. Like, you know, when my son gets older, I want to make sure he's X, Y, Z. Um, mm-hmm. I will say the things that have come to my mind, I'm curious to get your feedback on being a coach. Um, I really want to focus on my son being kind, Mm -hmm. just being a kind person. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that would have changed my life is if I had more confidence when I was younger. So I want him to be very confident in himself and who he is. Mm -hmm. And the, the final thing in my top three, I guess you can say is be a curious person, never stop learning, never stop wanting to learning and growing. Do you have thoughts on that? Uh, uh, those are great. I think, uh, when it comes to you and your son, I think that's, that's great. And what, how, how that's going to, uh, be, I guess, you know, for lack of better words, drilled into him is you constantly reinforcing those, those, that, you know, those, uh, those structures that you want him to have or develop, right. You want him to have those behaviors, right. You want him to be that way. So you have to constantly, uh, and reinforce that with him, but you also reinforce that through your behavior and your reactions and how you handle things. Right. Cause as I said, I've said this many times during this episode, it's learned behavior. So if you're trying to tell him to be a certain way, and then you're not practicing that way, what does that, what message does that send? Right. Mm -hmm. You tell, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, you want your kids to be successful in life, right? I want my kid to be successful. I want him to, you know, be rich. And I don't want him to be like me where we're living paycheck to paycheck. So I'm going to make sure he's, he's, he's doing what he needs to do to get on the right track so he can be wealthy. And, and, but you're living paycheck to paycheck. How can you tell your kid to, he can be anything and he can be, he can do whatever he wants in life. He can be anything he wants in life, but you're not. Mm. How, how are you, how are you teaching your kid that? Listen, son. You can be anything you want to be in life. You can grow up and be anybody you want to be in life. You can be as successful as you want to be in life. But dad, why do we live with grandma? Hmm. Why why can't I have a new pair of shoes then? I need a new pair. You know, those kind of things. So that, that, it bugs me. It drives me nuts when I see parents that do that kind of stuff. I'm not saying don't tell your kids they can't be anything in in their life that they want to be. That's obviously, 
they can do whatever they want to do, right? They can be who they want to be, but you need to live by that principle too. And if you're not, it's very tough for you to instill that in your kids. If I wasn't patient in the things that I did with my boys and patient in the way that I coached my players that I coached, how could I instill patience in my kids? You just can't because mm. they're going to learn what you're doing. It's just natural. It's just a natural progression. So if I start using drugs, right? If I start using drugs, more likely that my kids are going to start using drugs as well than not. It's more likely they will than they won't, right? One of the things that I had to do as a as a man, when I was in the Marines, they we joke, Marines learn how to fight. They learn how to kill, right? They learn how to kill. They learn how to cuss and they learn how to drink. That's what Marines did. That's what we used to joke about. That's what Marines, Marines know how to do. When I started having kids, I was a drinker. I drank, I drank alcohol and I wasn't a, uh, a drunk. I didn't coach when I was drinking at all. I was completely sober when I coached. Uh, I didn't drive a car when I'd been drinking at all. Even if we went somewhere and I had one beer, I still didn't drive. My, my wife drove. <clears throat> I just wasn't about that. But when I was home, I indulged a little bit and probably a little bit too much. And I had an activity once where I was, uh, a situation once where I was sitting in the living room and my I, I was sitting there watching TV and I was drinking a beer. I finished the beer and I asked my son, who at the time was 10, 11, 12, -ish, something like that. I asked him, he said, he said uh, son, can you go get me a beer out of the fridge? Okay, dad. So he gets up, goes and gets me a beer. And as he's handing me the beer, I went, what in the hell am I doing right now? Mm. Like I'm teaching my kids without telling them you need to drink. I'm teaching them to drink just by the, having them interact, being around that substance, right? I'm not telling them you, you're 12 years old, you need to start drinking. I didn't tell them that, but I did. I showed them, this is what somebody does when you drink. You get, you drink this, you use beer, you use, you use liquor, right? So now I'm teaching my kid at 11 or 12 that it's okay to drink. And I was like, wait a minute, what in the hell am I doing? And it just dawned on me. And I told my wife, I said, you know what? That really bugged me. I can't believe I did that. But I, like, I need to, I, need, I think I need to stop drinking. Hmm. And she said, I think you do too. She said, I've been meaning to talk to you about it for a while. I, I think you, she goes, I don't know if it's a problem, but it's certainly become more of a problem. And I think, I think it's probably a good idea. And I went, okay, that's it. I'm done. I'm not doing it again. Hmm. This September will be 15 years. Wow. Congrats. I had any alcohol. And I didn't do that because I wanted to do that. I didn't do that because I felt I needed to do that. I did that to protect my family. Mm. That's why I did that. So when I go out on social events, we were just in Nashville last week. My wife and I went to Nashville. We've never been. We wanted to go down Broadway. We want to see that, that activity. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Broadway on Nashville, but it is off the hook. It is insane. <laughs> it's bar after bar. It's band, music band after music band. It's crowds. It's awesome. It's just a great time. And guess what? We went into every single bar. And guess what I didn't do? I didn't have one single alcohol drink. Not one. I had non-alcoholic beer or I had seltzer water. That's what I drank. My wife had beer. My wife had a couple of cocktails, but I didn't. I sat and watched, enjoyed music, and people watched, watched people be stupid drunk, which I was roaring about. It was hilarious, right? <laughs> so uh, my whole point and all that is in order to instill the things that we want to instill in our kids to be who we want them to be or who they should be when they get older is they have to see it from us. They have to learn it from us. My boys right now are in their 20s. And yes, they go out and have drinks with their buddies. They go out to the bars and, 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 and enjoy cocktails with their friends, right? But guess what? They're not. They're not alcoholics. Why? Because they saw how I changed. Mm -hmm. And to this day, my boys tell me, dad, on my, on my September, when September comes around on my annual, you know, so sobriety birthday comes around, my dad, my kids always say, dad, thank you so much for making this sacrifice. To this day, they say that. That's and awesome. if that doesn't hit a parent right in the gut, I mean, I don't know what will, but yeah. The, the sacrifices we make and how we behave around our kids will instill the behavior that they have later in life. That's my whole point telling you all that. No, that, I mean, honestly, that's like the whole wrap up right there. That is amazing. That is kind of like the whole, that's just the best way to wrap up this conversation. And 
something I look forward to. I hope we stay in contact. I would love to have you back on. You can ask me how I'm doing around my son and if he's emulating me and am I being a good role model? Because that's something that's going to be really important to me because you just you just basically stated how important that is. And it's it's so true. It is just so yeah. very true. Um, Brian, I want to just thank you so much for coming on and just giving us what just over an hour of pure yeah. amazingness, the best advice, the best tips, like the best experience. Um, absolutely incredible. Com- completely understand why you're a coach. Continue along that path, please, because there's a lot of us that are going to need a lot of help, including myself. So like I said, I hope we stay in touch. Um, I would love to give the people an opportunity to find you, follow you, listen to you. So please let everybody know where they can do that. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, let me say thank you for uh, for having me on. Uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. And, and obviously, we will stay in touch for sure. And, and uh, I'll let my I'll let my team know that we need to get you scheduled to be on my show as well. Oh, we'd love um, to. We'll have you, have you on as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for letting me address that. It's um, everything pretty much is data podcast. Uh, my Instagram, that's mainly where I'm most active is Instagram, uh, data podcast. You can find me there. Uh, you can see, you know, I answer all my comments. I answer all my DMS, uh, uh personally, unless you send me a weird DM, uh, then I won't respond to you. But <laughs> if you have a question Don't or something about parenting, or you have something in general, you want to talk to me about, or you just want to tell me how your life is. I'm, I'm all down with that. I respond to all those, those, those comments. I get them all the time. Um, <clears throat> they can also go and they can email me at data tribe, uh, uh, shoot. Now I'm going to data tribe at gmail.com. That's right. the, That's the email. And they can email me there. And I have a, I have a, a couple people that, re- that, take care of my email and my podcast and stuff like that. But, um, I'm on all social media platforms. Um, data podcast, uh, can be found on everywhere, YouTube, and then everywhere you get your podcast, your audio podcast, they can be found in all those places. And then I'm on Facebook. I'm on TikTok. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, those are, I'm really all under my name, but, um, Instagram's the main one. Perfect. I will link that in the show notes as well. So you can just scroll down, click on it, follow you. Boom. Easy done. Brian, it's been an an amazing hour with you. Uh, I definitely can't wait to get you back on. Um, I'm glad we got connected and there's no question. I'll be coming to you shortly because things are about to get really real in my house. So (laughs) Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on, man. I appreciate it. And we definitely will stay in touch. Perfect. Talk soon.